Well, thank you, Pastor, for the introduction. I truly uh, must say that it has been to my own blessing the last 20 years in studying into these subjects. My only fear in standing up here is that I won't do it, um, what's the word, justice. So um, I would hope that you will all study into this subject yourselves. And may the Lord be lifted up today. I, what I really wish is that the true witness would come today and speak to us. Amen. And I would be happy to sit down. So last night we talked about the great controversy, just kind of laying the foundation, bird's eye view of 6,000 years, how Christ has been for 6,000 years been pointing to that Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, and how Satan, through those 6,000 years, has tried to bring reproach and confusion and falsehood to the very time that we're living today. So we shouldn't be surprised, even in our own church, when there is controversy. And it's my hope, though, that God will be able to raise up this church and through revival and reformation, that there will be a people ready to take a message to the world, which will include the message of righteousness by faith, which is law and gospel combined. So if we were to summarize last night's uh, talk, I suppose if I had one uh, statement to read, it would perhaps be this one. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. Why? For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. And that's why this message of righteousness by faith, or Christ our righteousness, needs to be proclaimed, not only in voice, but also in our lives, in the way we live. Statement continues, if he, Satan, can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. So if we do not fully understand and experience this message of righteousness by faith, the devil has power over us in our lives. So today, I want to talk about, this morning, during Sabbath school, I want to talk about why history is important and then lead us on into the early Advent movement and up to the 1880s. And then for the church service, I want to talk about that most important meeting when the Lord sent a most precious message to us as a people. And then this afternoon and, and tomorrow night, I want to spend um, three presentations on the revivals that came to this church when that message was uh, lifted up, began to be lifted up in the 1880s and 90s and the revivals that ensued. Well, the pastor mentioned it when I was um, at Weimar College there for, uh, we were at Weimar for 15 years. When I was at uh, the library there at Weimar, uh, during those years, I really became interested in Adventist history and how it can bless us as we study it today. So, open your Bibles, if you will, or you can read it on the screen. Psalm 78, we read this for the scripture reading this morning, at least parts of it. And I want to take a look at this psalm because it, to me, kind of uh, summarizes the purpose that God has uh, for history itself. In fact, this book, the Bible, is a history book inspired by God to be a guide to us. And notice what uh, Psalm 78 says here, verses 1 uh, to 4. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. So 
Notice the psalmist is saying that the works of the Lord are to be repeated to each and new, each generation. They would not fail to tell of the goodness and the praise that they have for the Lord and what he has done. He continues, the psalmist, for he established, verse 5, a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So notice, as each generation would tell the, the works of God to the next generation, then they in turn would do the same to the next generation, and the end result of that would be they would not forget the works of God, and they, but they would keep his commandments. Now, if the psalmist had stopped there, that would be, we would be blessed by that information, the purpose of God's history and telling about God's works and his goodness, and to teach that to each new generation. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. The very next verse, verse 8, says this, And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. And then for the next 30 verses, the psalmist goes through some of the history of the wanderings of Israel. Now sometimes when we think about, as, as human nature would have it, when we t want to talk about the past perhaps or our lives, we would want to dwell on all the, what we would consider the positive points. Why, why dwell on some of our failings and so forth? But God wanted the next generation to even know about the failings of their fathers for the purpose of warning them against repeating those mistakes, but also to encourage them with the mercy and goodness of God. Because it is even amidst human failings, that God's mercy and goodness is seen even brighter. After those 30 verses of describing the failings or wanderings of Israel, verse 38, the psalmist says, but he, God, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath, for he remembered that they were but flesh, Wind that passes away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him to the wilderness, provoke him in the wilderness, and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. So again, the psalmist is saying here that each generation, as they learn and listen to the history of God's leading in his, uh, amongst his people, even amidst their failings, it would show the mercy and goodness of God, as well as warn the next generation. Notice what Ellen White says in regard to this concept of teaching the next generation. This is what she said in 1895. The reason why the children of Israel forsook Jehovah was that a generation rose up that had not been instructed concerning the great deliverance from Egypt by the hand of Jesus Christ. Their fathers had not rehearsed to them the history of the divine guardianship that had been over the children of Israel through all their travels in the wilderness. So a generation came that had not been instructed and told of the stories of how God had led and delivered Israel even with their wanderings in the wilderness. And they ended up turning their backs completely on God and walking away. The Lord Jesus, Ellen White continues, had given special instruction from the pillar of cloud, bringing before parents the responsibility of teaching their children the statutes and the commandments of God. But the parents failed to act the part that God had assigned them in diligently teaching their children, so that they might have been intelligent in regard to the works of God in leading his people through the wilderness. Had the parents been true to their trust, 
the children would have seen, again, notice, the mercy and goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So even though that generation that ended up dying in the wilderness because they, of their murmuring and not being willing to go by faith into the land of Canaan, that retelling of that story actually helped build the trust and faith in that God who was so good and merciful. Well, what about New Testament times? Paul, in a chapter in 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, tells about the wanderings of Israel. And again, he brings out this point, similar point, in the New Testament. We're all familiar with this verse, verse 11. Now all these things, after he's talked about these wilderness wanderings, happened unto them for examples, or examples to us. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So Paul, in the, those early days of the Christian church, is saying these stories from the Bible, this history, is good for us to rehearse and to go over because it teaches us lesson, lessons for the, that very day. Well, what about our day? Well, Ellen White, talking about this statement or this uh, scripture, has this to say. Paul writes concerning the experience of the people of God in ancient times, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And then notice what she says. The prophet, prophets spoke less for their own time than for the ages which have followed and for our own day, present day. So the scriptures, the stories in there are for us today. But Ellen White would expand that thought even to our own Adventist history. And this statement which we read last night, we're familiar with this, is to remind us that we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. And she's speaking specifically of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, how God raised up this movement and how he has mercifully uh, been with us as a people for all these many years. In fact, at the turn of the century, Ellen White uh, it several times uh, counseled that even the works of the pioneers be reprinted so that the stories of how God had led in the past would be told. Notice this. In 1903, the record of the experiences through which the people of God passed in the early history of our Adventist work must be republished. 1905, she said something similar. The history of the early experience in the message will be a power to withstand the masterly ingenuity of Satan's deceptions. In other words, knowing how God led in the past, even in our own Adventist movement, will help us to defeat those, that masterly ingenuity of Satan and all of his um, subtle and sometimes not so subtle deceptions. So let's take time then this morning and look at some of this history of the Advent movement, how God raised up this movement and the purpose that he has for us as a people. So as you will know, of course, we're just going to take, a, again, a very... Uh, broad uh, bird's eye view. But as you remember that 1844 movement, the, the Advent awakening, and as the Advent believers from many denominations had joined together in this movement, not just William Miller, but other preachers around the world were preaching this judgment hour message. And then the disappointment came, 1844. And those that were left gathered together and during uh, Bible conferences, uh, in the 1840s, they began to study together. The Sabbath, the sanctuary, and other truths came together as they studied together their, their Bibles. And it came to be known as those, those times and the truths they discovered in the scriptures as the landmark landmarks of faith or, or the fundamental beliefs of the Adventist church. And in 1889, Ellen White kind of summarized those um, landmark truths in this statement. Notice what she says. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events. Opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven and having decided 
relation to God's people upon the earth. What's going on in heaven relates to us here on earth. Also, the first and second angel's messages and the third, unfurling the banner which was inscribed, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And of course, that's taken from the third angel's message, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. We're going to come back to that, that little section there, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in a moment. Ellen White continues, 1889, the light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. So she's naming here, oh, probably uh, six or seven main landmarks that were dis that studied out in those early days after the great disappointment. And I've just summarized them again here, the meaning and, of the passing of time in 1844 and so forth. But they also discovered more than just those, what Ellen White described as those landmark truths. There was a deeper understanding of the great controversy. Uh, Ellen White's vision in 1858, she spent the rest of her life writing on that concept, the great controversy. An expanded understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation, the mark of the beast, the seal of God, time of trouble, the 144,000, all of these things, and, and then the idea of the latter rain and the loud cry of Revelation 18, this final message that would go to the world before, right before Jesus was to return. Well, how was God going to take this little group who had studied these truths out and take that message to the world. Well, over that first generation of, Se of Ad Seventh-day Adventists, the church actually hadn't even been organized completely yet. God was to develop a, a network or a branches of the work that would build up a church in which, through these means, that message could be taken to the world. So one of the first things, of course, was organization. God would bring in uh, uh, concepts on how to organize the ministry or clergy, evangelism, mission or missionary work, all of these things during those first 30 years were uh, developed by God's direction in this movement. So the health and temperance work, sanitariums, medical missionary work, publishing, periodicals and books, uh, canvassing or colporting programs, all of these things still in existence today. And then an education system to educate the next generation, to train them to take part in this movement to an even greater degree in taking this message to the world. And of course, all of these branches of the work were to work together in unity. Even though they're doing different things, the message is the same and they're going to the world in their different branches of work with this message. Unfortunately, 1852, only eight years after the passing of time in 1844, and Ellen White writes this in 1852. Now, up to this time when Adventists, Seventh-day keeping Adventists, had read Revelation 3, they applied the Laodicean message to the nominal Protestant churches who had not followed with them in advancing light. But notice what Ellen White says, 1852. As I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal like the nominal church that they but a short time since separated from. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. And then she says, see Revelation 3, verses 14 to 20. Well, what does Revelation 3, 14 to 20 say? We're familiar with this, but I think it would do well for us to read this. Verse 14 of Revelation 3, unto, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. He says, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot, because thou sayest, verse 17, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, 
and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now this was, what would you say, this was quite a shocking revelation, so to speak, for a church that was actively motivated in moving forward under the direction of God to come to the conviction that, in fact, it's not them out there that's Laodicea, it's actually come into our own lives. Well, this message began to be preached for several years amongst Adventists, and you can see that for five or six years there, very prominently, many articles in the review and so forth. But the question is, what would this Laodicean condition do to the, the work of the church in all of its branches? Would it result in unity? Would it result in working together to spread a message? Or would that pride and self-sufficiency begin to take away the power of that message that was to go to the world? And that's exactly what happens. When you read through some of the Adventist history um, during this time period, and I would say most of Adventist history, there's really no golden era in the sense that all was well. God is still calling us today with this message. Well, what was the remedy? And thank God, Revelation doesn't just stop with verse 17. God has a remedy for us as a people, and it's found in these verse, verse 18. I counsel thee, says Christ, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Well, what does that mean? We could spend the whole weekend just on that one verse but we need to move on to cover many, much of this history. Ellen White defines or talks about this in many places. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes. She says, faith and love are the gold tried in the fire. So faith and love were lacking in the church, 1852. They need the divine love of God, which is represented by gold in the, tried in the fire. They need the white raiment of Christ's pure character, and they need the heavenly eye salve, that they might discern with astonishment, listen, the utter worthlessness of creature merit to earn the wages of eternal life. So here, right in the Laodicean message, is a description of a people that are not experiencing or understanding fully righteousness by faith. Another statement Ellen White makes in, the 18, in 1892, the Laodicean message has been sounding. Take this message in all its phases and sound it forth to the people wherever providence opens the way. And then notice how she defines it or summarizes it. Justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ are the themes to be presented where? To the perishing world. The Laodicean message is to us as a people, but it's not to stop there. It's the message that's to go to the world that God is also calling to repentance. But it has to start with us. Well, how far reaching would these remedies be as they are accepted and applied in the life in the church, in individual lives, and in the different branches of the church? All of these branches of the work, again, would be working in perfect accord and unity. And I can tell you, we don't have time to go into this, but there are, there's areas and branches of our work today in the Adventist church where we are not still fully in unity. Medical missionary work and health and temperance and the gospel have not been perfectly blended together, I believe, as God designed. Well, by 1883, this is some almost 40 years after 1844, Ellen White would summarize what the result was of not fully accepting yet that Laodicean message. And this is what she says, 1883. Had Adventists after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, that's the latter rain, <clears throat> proclaiming it to the world, that would be in that loud cry, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed 
and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. 1883, Ellen White is saying, Christ could have come by now. I'm going to turn my mic off because I need to cough. Ellen White, <clears throat> excuse me, Ellen White continues in this statement, 1883, she says, For 40 years did unbelief and murmuring and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from <clears throat> the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case, notice this, this is so important, in neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, the unconsecration, and the strife amongst the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrows so many years. That was 1883, and as Ellen White was looking back that generation of almost 40 years, she's saying the Lord could have come, but our own strife and worldliness and unbelief <clears throat> have caused this delay. And I wonder what would be said today. Well, I thought that, you know, often we think that the, uh, the Laodicean condition is like a liberal condition, so to speak, worldliness, and, and that's it. But someone gave me a quote here just a couple weeks ago that I wanted to throw in here or add in here as well that makes me believe that um, our, in our church, I don't care where you are in the spectrum of Adventism, we all need the Laodicean message. The Laodicean message is not... Uh, unto the liberals of uh, the Laodicean uh, church, I write these sayings, nor is it unto the conservative uh, Laodiceans, I write this saying, is to the church of Laodicea, Christ, the true witness, is writing these things. So notice what Ellen White wrote here in this statement. She's talking about a trip they had in 1857, right when this message to the Laodicean church is being proclaimed. And notice what she says. In the spring of 1857, I accompanied my husband on a tour east. This was a discouraging tour. The testimony to the Laodicean church had been generally received, but some in the East were making bad use of it. Instead of applying it to their own hearts, so as to be benefited by it themselves, they were using the testimony to oppress others. A few taught that the brethren must sell all before they could be free, while some all others also dwelt much upon dress, carrying the subject to an extreme. With a few others, there was a narrowing up of the work of the third message, or the third angel's message, and following of impressions and casting fear upon the conscientious. These things had a blighting influence and caused us to lay down our testimony on the subject almost entirely. So you see, the Satan tries every time God seeks to do something to bring revival to his people. Satan comes in with fanaticism, on one side or the other, to bring in strife and confusion. The design of the message to the Laodiceans was to rid the church of just such fanatical influences, but the effort of Satan has been to corrupt the message and to prevent its proper effect. He would be better pleased, listen, <clears throat> to have fanatical persons embrace the testimony and to use it in his cause than to have them remain in a lukewarm state. So Satan would be just as happy to have someone, you know, supposedly come out of that lukewarm state and take a fanatical approach to the Laodicean message, applying it to everyone else and forgetting themselves, than, than he cares about them even staying in a lukewarm state. I have seen, Ellen White continues, that it was not the design of the message to lead anyone to sit in judgment upon his brother, to tell him what to do and just how far to go, but for each individual to search his own heart and attend to his own individual work. It is the work of the angels to watch the development of character and to, to weigh moral worth. That's not our job. We can't do that. Well, what about this message of justification by faith? How does that fit in to this Laodicean message? And how does that fit into uh, the landmark truths that we as a people were to understand. Well, in that early statement that I started with uh, earlier this morning, we read that statement in 1889 where Ellen White talked about the foundational truths uh, that were studied out in the 1840s. And at the end of that, she said, 
the, the banner was inscribed, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Again, taking that from Revelation 14, 12, the third angel's message, is this description of God's people in comparison to those who have received the mark. They are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Well, notice what she says about that faith of Jesus part. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists of, as of equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language, says Ellen White, to express this subject in its fullness. In other words, the law was being lifted up, but the faith of Jesus part was kind of being left aside. The faith of Jesus, it is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world, took our sins, that we might take his righteousness. Faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. So again, Ellen White is saying that foundational truth, which was to be part of that Advent message, was being affected by putting the faith of Jesus aside. That message of righteousness by faith was not being proclaimed. Well, why was it not being proclaimed? Well, the Laodicean condition describes that. A church that's saying, we're rich and increased with goods, and Christ saying, you don't even have the robe of my righteousness on. A pride in being the remnant church. Now, there's not a problem with being a part of the remnant church, but it's that pride, the Jewish pride, like the Jewish pride, and they were the nation that God had chosen, and yet that pride in themselves led them to make terrible mistakes. An overreaction to the opposition against the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath. Now, the early Advent movement, as they begin to proclaim the Sabbath, and it's still true today, the opposition would come. Well, the, the law has been done away with. So the emphasis tended to go toward trying to defend the teaching on the Sabbath and the law being uh, not done away with. And then the faith of Jesus was left aside. A debating style of evangelism. Often a, a preacher would come to town, set up a tent, and he would challenge the other Protestant ministers to a debate. And so evangelism began to take on that debative style, and the faith of Jesus obviously was lost sight of. The false understanding that most converts come from other Christian churches, therefore they, they already understand righteousness by faith. And I believe this is actually something that we need to understand today. We looked last night at how Catholicism right now as we speak is saying, is joining with Lutherans and Methodists and saying we all agree on the subject of justification by faith. And yet Catholicism is still teaching uh, merit in man's uh, own works and penance as having somehow value in appeasing God. That's not, they may use the same words, but it's not the same message. And so the idea that we don't need to talk about righteousness by faith because all the other Christians already know about that, is, that's not true. Uh, I fail to realize that righteousness by faith is a key component to the, our last message, our last day message. And you find that in the latest in message and the loud cry and the, and, and the Revelation 18, one message to the world. And a failure to realize the uniqueness of Adventism's biblical understanding of righteousness by faith in light of the cleansing of the sanctuary. God has given us a full message of uh, salvation to go to the world. And it's, it's higher than even our own human thoughts can realize. Well, how do we see this failure working out in the church of that time, in the 18 that first generation. Well, just a few quick examples. I'm not even going to read the quotes here. But there was a series of articles uh, in the Review in 1854 on uh, the leading doctrines of Adventists. And there was no mention of the subject of the gospel or righteousness by faith. In 1872, there was a, a pamphlet or a, um, of the 25 fundamental beliefs of Adventists. It's now up to 28 today, but it was 25 at that time. And as you read through that entire book, there was only a couple paragraphs that even mentioned 
the, you know, the, the gospel or the righteousness by faith concepts. In uh, 1878, uh, Uriah Smith and James White had a biblical institute that they presented uh, at, a, at a, meeting, a series of meetings, and then it was published in a book form. It's uh, been republished again today. And as you go through that whole series of meetings, all wonderful presentations, of course, but there was no specific meaning or emphasis on the subject of righteousness by faith. So you see how this was being played out, exactly like Ellen White said, the law has been lifted up, but the faith of Jesus or justification, righteousness by faith has been put aside. And Ellen White would summarize the result of this. Notice, she says, on the one hand, the religionist generally has divorced the law and the gospel, while we have on the other hand done the same from another standpoint. We have not held up before the people the righteousness of Christ and the full significance of his great plan of redemption. We have left out Christ and his matchless love and brought in theories and reasonings, preached arguments. Unconverted men have stood in the pulpit sermonizing their own hearts, have never experienced the sweet evidence through a living, clinging, trusting faith of the forgiveness of their sins, how then can they preach the love, the sympathy, and the forgiveness of God for all their sins? So again, if as a church, the, those who are presenting are not uh, focusing on this theme as well, how can they present it to their own churches? One other statement. Many remarks have been made to the effect that in our camp meetings, <clears throat> the speakers have dwelt upon the law, the law, and not on Jesus. Notice, Ellen White's careful here. She says, this statement is not strictly true, but have not the people had some reason for making these remarks? Have not there stood in the desk as mouthpiece for God men who have had not a genuine experience in heavenly things, men who had not received the righteousness of Christ Jesus? And then again in another place, she says, we have talked the law, this is right, but we have only casually lifted up Christ as the sin-pardoning Savior. Well, this was going to change. And here's some examples of how that change came about. I wish you could see this more clearly, but in 1873, a Dr. M.G. Kellogg had an uh, engraving made. And it actually wasn't that big. It was only about two foot wide or so, and they would put it up on a stand, and then they would use this as a, this was early PowerPoint in the 1870s. They would use that as a pictorial guide to talk about the truths, the Adventist message, as they were presenting in their evangelistic series. Maybe you see a little better there. Um, You'll notice here there's the law tree, the all-seeing eye there in the back, which is interesting. Then the shadow of the cross on the sacrificial system on the, um, the, the left-hand side. And then the uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper on the, on the right-hand side. And this was, again, printed in 1873. It had a little booklet that went along with it to help explain the truths that this picture was, was uh, teaching. Well, uh, in 1876, James White um, had it, the uh, picture redone. Let me back up here. Notice the trail to heaven. Heaven is up there on the right, and there's a path that goes through the forest there. It's hard to even see how to get up there. In 1876, though, James White changed some things. He took that all-seeing eye out, and the, the pathway to heaven is more open. But the rest of the picture is pretty much the, the same. Then in 1883, another picture was made, and this was called Christ, the Way of Life. And you'll notice there are some changes in this picture. And the question is, what, why? And this is what James White said, writing to his wife in 1880. He says, I have a sketch also of the new print, Behold the Lamb of God, this differs from the 1876 way of life in these particulars. The law tree is removed. Christ on the cross is made large, and where is he placed? In the center. What led James White to make the change in this pictorial teaching aid 
that they were using in evangelism in uh, 1881. Well, some things were happening in James White's life that led him to see a need for a change in this picture. And this is what he wrote in January of 1881. Notice, he's writing in the review. He said, blessed, said our Lord, are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, Matthew 5, 6. With some, there is an unutterable yearning of soul for Christ. The writer, James White, is one of this class. With some of us, it has been business, work, and care, giving Christ but little room in the mind and in the affections. With others, it has been nearly all theory, dwelling upon the law and the prophets, the nature and destiny of man, and the messages, in other words, the three angels' messages, while destitute to an alarming degree of an indwelling Christ. So James White began to see that there was a lack in the church, and he was one of the main leaders, and he's being impressed by God. There needs to be a change. Our preachers need more encouragement. They should preach Christ more, and they should know more of him upon whom all our hopes of success here and of heaven hereafter depend. They need to preach him more, but they need to know of him more. Well, that experience or this new emphasis was seen by others. In fact, one of the men that traveled with him at the time had this to say. During the few months I was with James White, about eight weeks, right, this is written in 1881, so that I had the best of opportunities to know him thoroughly. In our travels together, he often mentioned the mistakes he thought he had made in his life. As we prayed alone together, he would weep over them and plead for the grace to be a true Christian man. Here's James White, even beginning to see, wow, I've really failed in so many areas. He, James White, often said to me privately and also spoke of it over and over in nearly all of his sermons this spring and summer of 81, that he felt he must be more tender toward his brethren, more compassionate toward the erring, and he must cultivate more love for Christ and more patience in his trials. As all will remember, wherever he, wherever James White preached the past few months, he dwelt largely upon what? Faith in Christ and on the boundless love of God. Something was changing in James White's life. And it was affecting how he preached, and it was affecting how he treated others. In fact, it even affected his marriage, where the rubber meets the road, right? We can be Christians so often in public that when we're home, that's where it so often falls apart. But notice what Ellen White reports what happened during this time, even in their own home. She says of James White, of James White speaking, this, she's quoting what James White says, I feel a sense of danger, and with it comes an unutterable longing for the special blessing of God, an assurance that all my sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. I confess my errors, he's talking to his wife, and ask your forgiveness for any word or act that has caused you sorrow. There must be nothing to hinder our prayers. Everything must be right between us and between ourselves and God. So here's James White, Ellen White is recalling, apologizing to her for things that he had said that were hurtful. And then Ellen White says, we there in humility of soul confessed to each other our errors and then made earnest supplication for the mercy and blessing of God. My husband remained bowed some minutes after our prayers had ceased. Then he arose. His countenance was cheerful and happy. He praised the Lord, saying he felt the assurance of the love of Christ. This new emphasis in James White life was changing his preaching, his personal life, and even in his home. Well, it went even farther than that. James and Ellen White realized they needed this emphasis needed to go on. They needed to get away from the heavy burdens there in Battle Creek and move to the West Coast where more time could be spent 
on writing and presenting the message of Christ. And notice, Ellen White says, spring of 18 and early summer of 81, we spent together at our home in Battle Creek. My husband hoped to arrange his business so that he could go to the Pacific Coast and devote himself to writing. He felt that we had made a mistake in allowing the apparent wants of the cause and the entreaties of our brethren to urge us into active labor in preaching when we should have been writing. My husband desired to present notice more fully the glorious subject of redemption. And I had long contemplated the preparation of important books. And one of those books, by the way, was The Desire of Ages that Ellen White had been wanting to work on. And this is early 1880s. Well, would they leave uh, Battle Creek? They realized they needed to get out of Battle Creek where all the burdens were so heavy with the, the work there and get somewhere where they could spend time in writing. And it was driven by this desire for a new emphasis. But notice what happened. I urged, Ellen White's writing here, I urged upon James the importance of seeking a field of labor where we would be released from the burdens necessarily coming upon us at Battle Creek. In reply, James spoke of various matters which required attention before we could leave, duties which someone must do. So they're planning, getting ready to leave, but there's still more that needs to be done. With tears, James expressed his anxiety of our institutions at Battle Creek. Said he, my life has been given to the uplifting of these institutions. It seems like death to leave them. I would rather die than leave, live to see these institutions mismanaged or turned aside from the purpose for which they were brought into existence. So James and Ellen are thinking we need to leave. James is ready to go, but he can't seem to let go and see the work, you know, fall aside that he has helped to raise up. He was even willing to say, I'd rather die than have to leave. And three weeks later, he died. Now, I don't think that was punishment from God, but God let him choose. Interestingly enough, Ellen White, after his death, she had a dream, and this is one of the most interesting dreams I've read in her, in her writings. And in her dream, James White is speaking to her, riding with her in a carriage and telling her what I'm going to read you. He says in this dream to Ellen White, James says, we have made a mistake. We have responded to the urgent invitations of our brethren and attended to attend important meetings. We had not the heart to refuse. These meetings have worn us both more than we were aware we might have done a great deal for years with our pens, and notice, on subjects the people need that we have had light upon and can present before them, which others do not have. Thus, James White is saying in this dream, you can go to work when your strength returns, as it will, and you can do far more with your pen than with your voice. We ought to have gone to the Pacific Coast before and devoted our time and energies to writing. Will you do this now? Will you, as your strength returns, take your pen and write out these things we have so long anticipated and make haste slowly? There is important matter which the people need. Even in a dream, God's speaking to Ellen White. There's an important subject that needs to be focused on that James and her were talking about, but that James White, because he couldn't leave, ended up dying. Another statement that is so interesting to me is what God promised Ellen White as she sat beside her dying husband in the summer of 1881. Notice what she said a few years later. When I sat with the hand of my dying husband in my own, I knew that God was at work. While I sat there on the bed by his side, he in such feverishness, it was there, like a clear chain of light presented before me. The workmen are buried, but the work shall go on. Notice what God tells her. I have workmen that shall take hold of this work. Fear not, be not discouraged, it shall go forward. It was there, I understood, said Ellen White. 
that I was to take the work and the burden stronger than I ever had borne it before. It was there that I promised the Lord I would stand at my post of duty to do as far as possible the work that God had given me to do with the understanding that God was to bring an element in this work that we have not yet had. So even as he's impressing James and Ellen White of an emphasis that needs to come to the church, as James White is dying, God is saying, I lay a workman down, but I will raise up others to bring in an element into this work that we have not yet had. Well, Ellen White, of course, was uh, really struggled after her husband's death. She ended up moving to the Pacific Coast, uh, lived with uh, W.C. White there in Oakland for a short while. And then she moved into her own home in Hillsburg in the summer of <clears throat> 82. And during that summer, she became sick to the point that um, she ended up being admitted to the sanitarium there in St. Helena. And after a week or so, she realized she wasn't getting better. And so she um, went back home, preparing actually to die. Well, that fall, there was a camp meeting in Hillsburg, 1882. And she decided, why not go out to the camp meeting and maybe hear some encouragement and also share for the last time with the people before I die. It looks as though I'm going to die. So she had them load her up in the back of a buggy on a couch, and they took her out there on that Sabbath afternoon. She was feeble, could hardly leave her bed. But at noon, she said, prepare me a place in the large tent where I can hear the speaker. Possibly the sound of the speaker's voice will prove a blessing to me. I'm hoping for something to bring new life. So even though she thought she was going to die, she still had hope. So they brought her couch up there, set it there, where she could hear the Sabbath sermon on that first Sabbath of uh, the camp meeting. And so she uh, sat there and listened, and the sermon was preached. Uh, the, the person who preached the sermon talked about how God had led in the history of Advent movement from 1844 to 1882. And at the end of that uh, sermon, Ellen White asked uh, the gentleman to help her up to the podium. Two of them had to help her up there because she wanted to share some words. And notice what she says. This is what happened when she got up to speak. After she had spoken a few sentences, there was a change in her voice and attitude. She felt a thrill of healing power. As she proceeded with her address, her strength was manifest. She stood firmly and did not need to hold on to the desk for support. The large congregation which witnessed the healing all noticed the change in her voice, and many observed the change in her countenance. They saw the sudden transition from death-like paleness to the flush of health, as the natural color was seen. One of the non-SDA businessmen of Hillsburg exclaimed, a miracle is being wrought in the sight of the whole congregation. So here Ellen White, she's at the point of death, she stands up to speak, and the Lord heals her that very day, October 7, 1882, at the Hillsburg camp meeting. And what do you do if the Lord has healed you uh, from the, your deathbed? Well, you put that person to work, right? That's exactly what happened. Ellen White then spoke, I think it was six or seven times, the following week during the camp meeting. And on the last Sabbath of that camp meeting, October 14, Ellen White presented a message in the afternoon on a rainy uh, afternoon there in Hillsburg on the subject of God's grace. And sitting in the back of that audit big tent was a young man, 27 years old listening to Ellen White's sermon. And this is what he would say years later about that sermon. Many years ago, the writer sat in a tent one dismal rainy afternoon where a servant of the Lord was presenting the gospel of his grace. And in the midst of the discourse, an experience came to me that was the turning point in my life. Suddenly a light shone about me and the tent seemed illuminated as though the sun were shining. I saw Christ crucified for me. And to me was revealed for the first time in my life the fact that God loved me and that Christ gave himself for me personally. It was all for me. 
If I could describe my feelings, said this young man later, they would not be understood by those who have not had a similar experience and to such no explanation is needed. I knew that this light had come to me was a revelation directly from heaven. Therefore, I knew that in the Bible I should find the message of God's love for the individual sinner, and I resolved that the rest of my life should be devoted to finding it there and making it plain to others. The light that shone upon me that day from the cross of Christ has been my guide in all my Bible study. Wherever I have turned in the sacred book, I have found Christ set forth as the power of God to the salvation of individuals and, they, and have never found anything else. The scriptures came to life for this young man. And that young man was E.J. Wagner, who sat in the back of that tent and heard Ellen White preach. He would soon be join, jo joined by <clears throat> A.T. Jones. They would begin to preach and to write. And uh, six years later, Ellen White would hear them, hear them preach at Minneapolis. And this is what she said. I have had the question asked, what do you think of this light of these men are presenting? Why I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years, the matchless charms of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your minds. When Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips, notice, that I had heard accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. When she heard Wagner preach, she said, this is the very thing that my husband and I were talking about right before his death, that emphasis of lifting up Christ. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly, and they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, Ellen White says, every fiber of my heart said, amen. Well, that message is a message of righteousness by faith, and it's to go to the dying world. And you will find it described in the scriptures in so many ways. It's in the latest in message. It's in the three angels' messages. Justification, righteousness by faith, the righteousness of Christ, Revelation 18, latter rain, loud cry. It's all talking about this message that God has given to us as a people. And Ellen White uh, describes it, notice in this statement, the time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Notice how she blends all of those concepts together, the loud cry, third angel's message, righteousness of Christ our righteousness, and the, the light of that, Revelation 18 angel, that's to fill the whole earth. Well, just a, one last slide here. This, I looked at Ellen White's use of these words before 1880 and after 1880. The only point I'm making is that Ellen White's emphasis and uh, use and, and writing on these subjects increased immensely following that time when her and James White were saying there needs to be an, an emphasis of lifting Christ up even more in our church. Now, obviously, Ellen White believed in these things before. She said, I've been teaching, I've been trying to teach these for 45 years. But God was bringing a message even more prominently to the church to lift it up before the world. But here's the catch, and we'll look at this during the divine service. What is justification by faith? It's the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. And that's where the rub is. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Human nature fights against surrendering to Christ and his righteousness. This uh, morning during the divine service, we're going to look then at what happened when God brought this most precious message of emphasis on Christ and his righteousness to us as a people at what Ellen White called the most important meeting. Would you stand with me as we close this morning? Father, we thank you for being so merciful to us as individuals and as a people. And Lord, as we look back and see how you have led during this Advent movement, 
We are so thankful, Lord, that you have not given up on us personally or on us as a people. And Lord, we long that this emphasis and this lifting up of Christ would be more a part of our own lives and in our church today, especially among our young people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.